when you live authentically, you bring all the power and the magic of you into every aspect of your life. You become more powerful. You can succeed more than you ever could before. Your relationships will be deeper and richer and more extraordinary. So instead of focusing on what if this person doesn't like me the way that I really am, you know, change the channel to focusing on everything that can go right. And what you'll realize is the people that don't support you for who you truly are, aren't the people that are meant to be in your life. And to be perfectly honest, they're holding you back. Because when we are living inauthentic, we are not living to our highest potential. And even though things may be really good, what if things could be absolutely extraordinary if you lived truly as you? So it's a matter of not settling. It's not it's a matter of not settling for mediocre relationships or friendships and deciding that you deserve more. You deserve more and you can have more, but it requires you bringing all of who you are into your life. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have the just magnificent, joyous, incredible Siri Lindley. Siri is both a triathlon world champion, aquathon world champion, and winner of the ITU World Cup Series, having been the number one world ranked athlete in 2001 and 2002. Not bad for someone who didn't know how to swim eight years prior to these achievements, huh? Curious? Yes, so was I. In 2003, Siri retired at number one in the world and proceeded to coach other athletes to nine world championship crowns, two Olympic medals, and a whole lot more. She is the author of her book, Surfacing, From the Depths of Self-Doubt to Winning Big and Living Fearlessly. And she is the co-founder of Belief Ranch and Rescue, which focuses on rescuing horses from slaughter with her beautiful Aussie wife, Rebecca Keat, who is also a world champion triathlete. Amongst all of this, Siri is also a speaker for the legend himself, Tony Robbins, which is where I first personally connected with Siri. I was part of the virtual Unleash the Power Within event last year and immediately upon her speaking, I felt the deep authenticity of her energy and in that moment decided I need to be in the space of this person. I signed up and participated in her mastermind, then proceeded to do group coaching and even got a little ultra marathon guidance from her. And fortunately for me, I can now call Siri a close friend and family. In this conversation with Siri, she shares vulnerably her story of not feeling enough. Through this feeling, she became a people pleaser and developed anxiety, depression, and OCD, which was only fueled by her discovering she was gay and this not being accepted by some of those who were closest to her. She shares with us the way in which she overcame this sense of not enoughness, leading her to becoming fearlessly authentic, to be free of suffering, to love herself, to feel truly worthy, and to feel safe in her own skin. In late 2019, Siri was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, and she shares with us the importance of making a decision in those defining moments of what to focus on and what such adversity means. She encourages us to believe in our own decisions and to do whatever it takes to make them happen. For her, this meant not only surviving, but thriving. She emphasizes the importance of the appreciation of simple things, of gratitude, and of being present, which... For any of you who are consistent to be human listeners, this is certainly a reoccurring theme, a theme that we should not only be aware of, but practicing in our own lives. So here is where I would normally say, please rate, review, share with friends and family, but I think sometimes this can come across a little too robotic. So I would ask, if you have been listening to this podcast and you are enjoying it, then please genuinely rate that, review that. Share with friends and family if you think this could in some way improve their lives and become part of the To Be Human Collective. Okay, so hi, it's me again. Unfortunately, the first 10 minutes of this podcast became distorted, so I've decided to and have permission from Siri to summarize what we cannot recover. Though I understand it's not as great coming from me, they are still Siri's words, so I ask you to listen up because they're important. And then we will jump right into this truly beautiful and authentic conversation. So I started as per usual with a quote, and this quote came from Siri's book, Surfacing. 
Winning the 2001 World Championships was an out-of-body experience. I'd achieved an impossible dream and could not wrap my head around the magnitude of the moment. Amid the sense of suspended reality, the overwhelming feeling was gratitude. I felt an immense appreciation for every single blessing in my life, past and present. I stood atop that podium as the person I'd always yearned to be, strong, resilient, undaunted. I then proceeded to ask Siri to share about the person she was at the beginning of becoming strong, resilient, and undaunted. So in reading this quote of hers to her, it gave her goosebumps as it took her back to this very moment. The whole why in achieving an impossible goal was to find love for herself, to prove to herself that she is safe inside of her own skin, that she is worthy inside of her own skin, and that she can make a difference in this world. As a college student from the outside, it looked like she had it made. Great grades, was attending an Ivy League university, was a varsity athlete, but she was riddled with anxiety and fear. She was what everybody needed her to be to fit in, to be accepted, to be appreciated. And because of this, she didn't know who she was. Tony Robbins came into her life through books and cassette tapes. And Jenna, speaking here for a moment, any of you Tony fans out there like myself, you've got to love a throwback Tony Robbins cassette tape story of transformation. Anyway, I digress. She finally woke up to the truth of her life, that her experience of her life was totally up to her, It wasn't something happening to her. She realized she was focusing on everything that was missing and everything that she feared, everything she didn't want to happen and wanted to avoid, everything she essentially had no control over. This led her to a lot of anxiety, depression, and sadness. Tony says where focus goes, energy flows. And through this, she looked at her own patterns of focus and thought, no wonder I'm a mess. In that moment, she made a commitment that she would focus on everything she had and was grateful for. She was a great athlete, a good student. She went to a good school. She began to focus on what she loved and wanted to create in her life, on everything she had control over, her own experience of life. She decided she was going to create a masterpiece and not let life be a tragedy. But in saying this, life throws you all kinds of different things. You learn, you grow and evolve. And she discovered she was gay. She shares it was hard, but she was okay with it. She was learning something about herself and that felt good. However, a couple of years later, Siri's dad found out and he rejected her. He didn't want to believe that he had a daughter that was gay. He hung up the phone and she didn't hear back from him for a few years after that. And it broke her heart. Everything that she was and had achieved was worth nothing now that she was gay. She didn't know who she was anymore. But then she discovered triathlon. She watched a friend do a race and how all different types of people were out there pushing themselves and discovering something about themselves, believing in themselves to overcome a great challenge. This inspired her to reflect and she thought this is a way of proving to herself that even a gay woman can achieve amazing things, that she can even inspire others to make a difference that she can be loved by herself. That triathlon would be the perfect vehicle not only to find herself, but to find a love and appreciation. The interesting thing in all of this is she didn't know how to swim. It was indeed what felt at that time in her life an impossible goal. She entered into a race and came dead last. She embarrassed herself, having ran half the run with a helmet on and was running in the wrong lane, having faster people become quite pissed off with her. It was an absolute disaster, but in all of this, she never felt so alive in her entire life. And she crossed the finish line as if it was the Olympic games. But that night when she went to bed, everything that she was oblivious to that day came flooding back. Images of people laughing, pitying her, poor girl, how embarrassing, kids laughing, people getting angry with her. She started bawling and she went into her mum's bedroom. Her mum said she should be so proud. You did a triathlon. Now focus on things that you're good at. But she turned to her mum and she said, I'm going to be the best in the world at this sport. These were words that at that point in her life were not reflective of her personality. 
She looked crazy, but she meant it with all of her heart. Siri shares, when you declare like that, declare it to yourself and the person you love the most in your life, it's powerful. You become accountable and she knew she would not let herself down. She was going to do everything in her power to make it happen. Because a whole sense of beingness and security in herself lay in achieving this goal. This was the power of her why. No matter what challenge or obstacle, she knew she would overcome it and find a way. And she did. That day that I shared in her quote, after many failures, disappointments, humiliating moments, she achieved the impossible goal. She felt this overwhelming sense of pure gratitude, bliss. Crossing that line, she thought, yes, that is me. Not just that day, but the eight years before it, when she first decided she was going to be the best in the world, not knowing how to swim. She got there because she backed herself. She believed and she never gave up. Knowing that all paid off in the end was an incremental moment for Siri, the most powerful moment in her life. And she is forever grateful that she had the courage to say yes to that goal. Thank you so much, Siri, for sharing that incredible, incredible story with me. Um, I've heard it a few times now, obviously, because I follow you uh, very closely. Um, and every time I hear that story, it just inspires me a little bit more deeply. So thank you so much. Um, hearing that story, there's something that comes up so strongly, and that is your hunger, your hunger for self-discovery, your hunger to become more. Can you explain a little bit more about like, where does that come from and how does that show up in your life now? Hunger. Um, for me, I think it got stronger and stronger because when you are going through something difficult and when you've kind of carried around something that causes you suffering, when you finally get a recipe or an idea as to how to stop that suffering. All you want is to be free of the suffering and to find a way to create things that will bring you joy and bring you happiness. So for me, it was this hunger came from wanting so desperately to figure out how to be my best me. Because if I can be my best me in as many moments as possible, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to make other people happy. I'm going to bring out the best in myself. I'm going to bring out the best in others. And that was all I wanted was just to be free of suffering. And there is a way to do that. There is a way to, you know, find, be able to get into a beautiful state, even in those darkest moments. And once you figure out how to do that, you can truly change your own life. And, and that's the hunger. The hunger is, you know, let me find a way to love myself. Let me find a way to feel safe in my own skin. Let me find a way to feel worthy so that all that pain that comes from not feeling safe, not feeling worthy can go away. So when you were experiencing OCD and anxiety and depression when you were younger, from the outset, from the like external, your life looked incredible. It looked amazing. You were a high achiever. You came from, you know, a, a well-off family. Um, was the missing piece in all of that authenticity? Absolutely. And, um, well, there's a story behind the anxiety and the worry and my mom my mom and dad got divorced when I was four. She remarried a very famous man. And um, in the early days when they were just dating, he'd broken up with her and she tried to take her own life and realizes now, of course, that that was a crazy mistake. But I was only four years old and I found her and it was devastating. And as young children, when something like that happens, you give it whatever meaning you can. And the meaning I gave it is that I'm not enough for my mom to want to stick around for me. And 13 years later, they've already gotten married. He came back, they got married. 13 years later, he asked for a divorce. 
And even though I'm a 16 year old or whatever, however, I think I was 16 years old and I know better in my mind, I'm thinking the last time he left, my mom tried to take her life. So my every waking moment was spent trying to be everything I could be to make life worth living for my mom. Even though, you know, when I asked her, she would have never thought about taking her life. She would have never, she was going to find her way out of this. She was going to strengthen. She was going to recover. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I've got to keep her alive. I've got to keep her alive. And so every waking thought was, you know, am I enough? Am I doing enough? Am I making her happy? And in that, I not only, you know, got OCD to try and manage the, the chaos and, and the worry and the fear, but I lost myself completely. And, you know, my way of thinking that I would make life worth living for her was by achieving and being someone she could be proud of and being the, pe the pleaser, you know, pleasing everyone and being everything that everyone needed me to be. But I had no idea who I was. And that's scary. And as you know, Jenna Louise, you know, my whole mission now is about living fearlessly authentic and, and helping people find their way back home to who they really are and celebrating that beauty, that magic of who they are. Um, because if you're living inauthentically, and, and that doesn't mean it's on purpose, like you're trying to be fake, but it's like you really truly don't know who you are. You lose touch with what matters to you most in your life. You know, living authentically is living in alignment with your values. And, and those are the things that, that matter most to you. And if you're not doing that, you'll often find yourself in relationships or businesses or situations where you're just not happy and you don't understand why. So you're absolutely right. It was a lack of authenticity, not on purpose. Um, but I have definitely proven to myself over time that when you live authentically, fearlessly authentic, that you truly can find that deep joy within. Yeah, I can definitely resonate with that point of view. I remember probably about six or seven years now, I was asked who I was. And immediately I was like, oh, well, I am who I am. Like, who else would I be if I were not to be me? And in that moment, I realized, like, I'm not actually being my authentic self. And it was like I went from this world of thinking that everything and every, like, everything that I did up until then was me and then realizing that most, for the most part, it wasn't. And it was like it opened up this whole new world of self-discovery. And how was that for you? Did you, uh, you know, find joy in that discovery, realizing who the real you was? Well, I think my story is similar to you in the sense of uh, I found endurance sport very helpful. I found the immersing myself in training and nature and around a, a, a supportive community was a really good basis to that self-discovery. I think there were certainly moments in my life where I went, I immersed myself in more disempowering vehicles, I suppose. And that was certainly when I was working in corporate. Um, I didn't have probably the empowering outlets that I do today for self-discovery work. But I think it's a very common story among us that, you know, you have that sort of defining moment in your life when you realize, oh, wow, like I, I am not being me. And there's, there's something really exciting about beginning that journey consciously and intentionally of becoming who you truly are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So how would you, like in your own experience, because I know now you actually do masterminds supporting people and guiding people in becoming fearlessly authentic. For, for the listeners that are potentially at that defining moment where they're starting to reflect on who they are up until this point, how would you encourage them to continue this journey? Because certainly to my understanding, it's not always a smooth journey. 
um, but it's definitely a worthwhile one. Right. I mean, any big change like that is scary because you've been living your life a certain way and people know you for who you've pretended to be or, or, you know, whatever it is. And that is scary. But instead of focusing, if you're at that kind of a point in your life, instead of focusing on everything that could go wrong, focus on everything that will go right when you make this decision. So much greater joy, greater happiness. You, when you live authentically, you bring all the power and the magic of you into every aspect of your life. You become more powerful. You can succeed more than you ever could before. Your relationships will be deeper and richer and more extraordinary. So instead of focusing on what if this person doesn't like me the way that I really am, you know, change the channel to focusing on everything that can go right. And what you'll realize is the people that don't support you for who you truly are, aren't the people that are meant to be in your life. And to be perfectly honest, they're holding you back. Because when we are living inauthentic, we are not living to our highest potential. And even though things may be really good, what if things could be absolutely extraordinary? if you lived truly as you. So it's a matter of not settling. It's not, it's a matter of not settling for mediocre relationships or friendships and deciding that you deserve more. You deserve more and you can have more, but it requires you bringing all of who you are into your life. Because I think you're right. I think one of the biggest challenges that in my life I've experienced and seen in, in friends who have decided to, to go on this journey is one of the scariest elements of it is other people's reactions to you. And I feel like it's such a powerful one and it, it genuinely stops many people. And because you almost experience that feeling of loss and of grief, like changing and, and becoming more of who you are, you have to actually let go of a lot. Absolutely. And But the beautiful part about it is, you know, like on the day when my father called me and he asked me the question, he said, somebody told me you're gay. Is this true? I could have said, because that's a defining moment, isn't it? Where I could say, no, no, it's not true. That's not me. And I told him it was true. Now I lost him temporarily, but I gained so much more self-respect being able to trust in myself, bringing all of me into my life. And eventually he came back when he took the step to really grow as a human being. And now our relationship is stronger than I could have ever dreamed it to be. So yes, it is a letting go, but it doesn't necessarily mean letting go of things forever. Sometimes it does. And when you look back, you'll be grateful and you'll say, God, that's actually a really good thing because if I stayed there, I wouldn't have this in my life or that in my life. So yes, there is a letting go, but it is so worth the temporary pain you might feel in changing a certain group of friends that you hang out with, you know, and deciding, you know, instead of hanging out with people that really don't want to do much with their lives. They don't want to grow. They don't want to change. They don't want to explore whatever it is. I'm going to have to leave that behind and discover a new group that shares my passions, shares my, you know, desire to want to be the best that they can be. And that will bring out the best in you. And also the people that were in your former group, you'll inspire them to step out of their comfort zone and perhaps stretch themselves a little bit more. So it's for the good of everyone. In my opinion, I always think it's for the good of everyone. You're saying, and actually there's this incredible visual of a bald eagle. The only other bird that attacks a bald eagle is a black crow. 
and the eagle, as it's flying, the black crow comes and nips at it as, at its wings, trying to hold it down and get it to drop down to the ground. And the eagle, instead of dropping lower and succumbing to, you know, the nips of the black crow, just soars higher and higher and higher until the black crow can no longer breathe at that altitude and the crow drops off. And the eagle just continues to soar higher and higher and higher. And I always see this in my mind when I'm thinking, oh, but they don't want me to be more. They don't want me to be more. They want to hold me back. You can fall down and be eaten by the crows, or you can soar higher like the eagle and invite everyone else to rise above with you. So, yeah, I mean, it's a tough decision, but it is always worth it. And the people that truly love you are going to just want to see you happy and therefore will support your journey ultimately, even though they might fight it initially. To see you happy, to see you thriving is the ultimate joy you could give your parents, your loved ones, and hopefully your friends, if you have the right friends. Um, but yeah. Because it's that element of self-compassion that comes into play, isn't it? Because you're not, once you make that decision to be more like authentic, it's not like you just immediately show up in all of your true essence and, and that's, that's you done. It's, it's a daily practice. And I remember reading in your book, you were talking about during your triathlon days of gaining sponsorship, Ralph Lauren actually approached you about sponsoring you and they had particular guidelines for you to be a part of. And that was sort of a defining moment for you in challenging sort of how, how much you had stepped into that strength of yeah, authenticity. It's a fragile thing. You know, I had not yet started winning races. I wasn't that good and triathlon's expensive. You're traveling all around the world and it's hard. And suddenly they had this sporting line RLX and they asked, they wanted me to be on their triathlon team. And it was this great salary and bonuses and I went to New York for this meeting with them and I'm so excited. And after the meeting, they said, well, this is going to be great, except two things have to happen. Number one, you need to grow your hair long. And number two, you need to get a boyfriend because we're family. You know, our image is such that you need to fit in. And I'm ashamed to say, but I think a lot of athletes would have made the same decision at that point that. I wanted to make my dream come true so desperately and I needed that financial support that I left that office, stepped right back into my closet and literally slammed the door shut and had to pretend to be straight. And it was painful. It was really painful. Now, yes, it that support meant everything as far as it helped me so much get to the point where I became a world champion. But after that, um, I really had to reconcile with myself the fact that I had abandoned my true self for my career. And I made a commitment that I would never, ever do that again. And I think that's why, you know, this path of authenticity is so important to me. Um, I don't want other people to have to feel the pain that I felt in abandoning myself. And I also want people to understand that when you do embrace your authenticity, the rewards are just beyond your imagination. It just changes everything in life. The things that really matter, you know, like relationships and your human potential, everything you're capable of experiencing as a human is just that much greater when you're living authentic. But that was hard. So it's fragile. But I think, um, you know, I used to carry shame around that decision. And I realized I needed to be bring compassion to it and understand that at that time, I felt that that was the only way that I was going to be able to continue pursuing this dream and to have compassion 
for, for that part of me and to feel proud that I was able to then, you know, get back on my path and not, you know, hammer myself for falling off it, but instead being even that much more committed to never straying away from myself again. It's such a powerful story. And I think one that many people can connect with is that striving for external rewards. And I love how you say, you know, it was about focusing on what matters. And I know in my own personal story, you know, I I had a job that I was incredibly unhappy and unfulfilled with, anxious, depressed, all the things. (laughs) And everyone kept telling me, but you know, you, you're going to make a lot of money and, you know, this is the best job and you're going to be meeting all these successful people. And, and I was just so, um, unhappy and, and, and I actually questioned, you know, whether I was an ungrateful person because I was so unhappy in all of this external success. But I think, you know, along the lines of your story, it's about understanding that, in a moment where you feel like you only have one option and that option means not showing up in all your authenticity, that that's not true. There's always many options and it's on you to seek that's them out. Right. That beautifully said, and I would agree with that 1 million percent. And one thing, Jenna Louise, that I think about so often um, is at the end of our days here, like what's really going to matter? What are, what are the things you're going to be thinking of? And I think of three questions. Did I live? Did I love? And did I matter? That's what's going to matter to me. Not, you know, did I make a ton of money? Did I have a Lamborghini? Did I live in a mansion? You know, that doesn't, that's not going to matter. Even, you know, how many followers did I have on Facebook or something? Like, that doesn't matter. And so in every moment when there's a question about something I'm asked to do or something that I choose to do, I think of those three questions in my mind. And I think are these things that will help me be able to say, yes, I lived. Yes, I loved. Yes, I mattered. And if it's not, I don't do it. And um, but in that situation, you know, had I known what I know now, I would have made another, a different decision, but I wouldn't change a thing because I learned so much from it. And in sharing that story, um, it can be really helpful to others. Yes. And as said, it's just so important to have that self and self compassion in all of it. I'd love to know what does, did you matter? What does, what does mattering mean to you in life? bringing sunshine and light into people's worlds, um, helping them discover the beauty and the magic inside of themselves, helping free others from their pain, because I believe I have some answers that I can share that can help people, you know, finally leave their pain and struggles behind. Um, Did I encourage people to go after their seemingly impossible dream? Did I inspire? Did I love with all my heart? Did I make someone feel so special, so important, like they matter? Because if I can make someone else feel like they matter, then that makes me matter. But it's those things, you know, it's, it's, it's all those the personal uh, influence that I can have in a beautiful way that lights up someone's life. I guess that's the easiest way to put it is I just want to light up other people's lives in some way. And if I do that, I will have mattered. It's beautiful. And being now a, a triathlete coach, do you find any of your athletes are motivated by, I suppose, for lack of a better word, something that's negative? Because, you know, you're here and you're saying to matter is to like bring sunshine into people's lives and positivity and gratitude. 
have you ever had any athletes that sort of show up and be like, oh, no, this is a little too fluffy or, you know, whatever the word is that they would use, like, no, this needs to be like more grind and grit and like coming from a a self-motivating place because I'm not feeling enough. Absolutely. And, you know, even if you look at me as an athlete, you know, I was being inspired by my pain and wanting to not feel that pain, wanting to feel worthy, wanting to feel safe in my own skin. So, I mean, that's not necessarily this rosy, like, oh, I just love this sport and I want to be amazing. Like, there's definitely that gritty part of it that comes from, you know, wanting to create some kind of a change within yourself. And that's not always easy. Change is hard. Change takes hard work. But where my athletes, you know, I think one of, I'm thinking of one athlete in particular, an amazing athlete, multiple Ironman winner and just amazing. She felt that anything magnificent in life comes with great, great pain because she had always like been suffering when she had her best races. She was always going through like the hardest time in her life when she'd have that ultimate victory. And when she came to me, my goal was to say, you don't have to be suffering or hurting to achieve great things. You can achieve great things by being pulled to something or called to something rather than pushed by this deep pain or whatever it is, torment to achieve great things. And that was a hard, um, that was a, that was a big uh, task to take on, but she ultimately found her way to, and it just took, you know, one race of having been happy and, you know, feeling safe in her life and feeling loved and supported. And she had this incredible race one day and she realized, wow, it's true. I don't have to be in pain to have great things happen. And that's a huge discovery because if you have that mindset that anything magnificent only comes with pain, you almost create situations, you create problems, you create chaos, you create struggles because you want to be successful. So, but if you're happy, oh my God, I better create a, an issue, which is what this athlete was doing. And it freed her from that pattern that wasn't serving her because ultimately with that kind of stress, that kind of angst, eventually that takes its toll on your body. So for me as a coach, my concern is the athlete and their health and their longevity and their ability to be consistently good over time. And that's why this became so important to me. Um, but I will always, you know, when an athlete has a disaster of a race or a disappointment or they get injured, yes, I'm going to be the one to say, look, there's a gift in this. What can you learn from this? What you learn from this struggle that you're going through right now is going to help make you a champion. So that part of my attitude um, and also, you know, having them understand that it's not just about them, that how they live their lives, how they train, how committed they are, like that is making a difference in everyone's life who is witnessing them living theirs. And in paying attention to that, it gives them a greater um, initiative, a greater purpose, a, a being able to focus also outside of themselves, I believe gives them even more power to do great things. So that's what I bring to the table, but I am by no means an easy coach. And <laughs> <laughs> but that's, in my opinion, tough love. And I'm still loving them. But I am having to do it in a way that is going to teach them something invaluable, get them to find more from inside themselves than they think they have. And tough love is a form of love, you know. So I'm always loving, but it's not always easy love. And 
I guess that's the best way to describe it. I think this is a wonderful segue of the idea of being pulled towards something with your recent experience with acute myeloid leukemia. Yeah. Um, You know, I got diagnosed in November 2019, totally unexpected. Life was just amazing. You know, my athletes are kicking ass and I'm loving my, I'm speaking around the world. I'm in love with my wife. We're doing good work with our nonprofit horse rescue. And then it's like, you've got acute myeloid leukemia and genetic mutation. And this is like, not good. But I think that that's why it was such a powerful moment because there is no way I was going to let my life go you know, to reach this space where I'm happy inside myself, happy in my relationships, happy in my career, living absolutely fearlessly authentic in every single moment. And because of that, there was so much to lose that when I got the diagnosis, I said, no, this is not my time to go. I don't care what the statistics are. I'm not a statistic. I'm Siri Lindley. I've already proven that what seems impossible is possible. And I'm going to do that again here because this matters more than anything ever has before in my entire life. And I made the decision that I'm going to survive and I'm going to thrive on the other side of this. And this is where, you know, my life makes perfect sense. Because I took on this goal as a 23-year-old of of something impossible to go from not being able to swim and sucking at the sport to becoming a world champion eight years later. Like that convinced me, it was my proof that the impossible is really possible when you believe and when you're willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And how it just prepared me so beautifully for this that was going to be the greatest, hardest challenge of my entire life. But just having that proof gave me the confidence to know that if I can fully discipline my thoughts, okay, from learning from what I learned in college, discipline my focus, instead of focusing on what I didn't have, which was my health, I'm going to focus on what I do have. I've got this mindset of steel. I've got this heart that wants to live. I've got passion for life. I've got a loving wife, an amazing mom, amazing dad, donors, doctors, all that. I have everything. Focus on that. You can feel the difference in the energy, right? Instead of focusing on what I fear dying, I'm going to focus on what I love. And what I, so I create vision boards, you know, of me running and coaching and speaking and doing all the things I love. And I focused on that, on what I was going to create, not on what I feared. And I focused on what I had all the control over, which was the meaning I gave this experience and what I chose to focus on in every single moment. Now that wasn't easy. You get that sick and it is a constant, constant you know, conditioning of the mind to go from, you know, obsessing over how sick I was, how weak I was, and all the machines attached to me, you know, my fear, my devastation of going through this. It's like, no, this is not strengthening me. This is weakening me and it's making me feel worse. So change the channel, focus on gratitude. Okay, my mom's lying on the couch in the hospital 30 nights in a row. My wife, every single day, coming to me, the best doctors, you know, like, and that gave me energy. And I was so, when you talk about being pulled, I was so pulled to this decision that I made that I'm going to survive. I have way too much life to live. I've got work to do. I've got, you know, people to help. I have so much love to give. And that was just such a strong pull that no matter how weak I got, I could feel that that pull and nothing was going to stop me. And thank God I'm here today, cancer free and thriving and knowing with all my heart 
that I will still be thriving 10, 15, 20, 25 years down the line, even more because of my mission, my purpose, and what I know is my destiny. But being pulled is a much different, you know, and I would actually look back at my career as an athlete. I was very much pushed. I was pulled to this, you know, this idea of being able to love myself at the end. That pulled me. But every day it's like, I have to do this. I have to do this because I, I must be uh, it, uh, worthy. I must be loved. I must be, you know, and it was more of a push. And now I want to move away from um, working with that feeling of force behind it and have everything I do come from a place of flow, which means coming from a place of being pulled, not pushed. And so would you recommend, because obviously, I mean, you hear this a lot with people that sort of come to a situation where they're faced with potential death and things become a lot more clearer to them. Would you recommend for people that aren't in that situation to, to still basically live the, with the same depth of being pulled and clarity and vision. Absolutely. You know, mortality motivation is a real thing. And what I mean by that is when you realize that you never know how long your life is, you never know how long you have here, do it right. And yes, it takes being a, in a situation like mine to really be faced with that and to say, wow, this is life or death. Like, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm going to make sure that it's a lot of time. But mortality motivation, if you can stand thinking about, you know, when your time is up and think about what is going to matter most to you at that point in time, when you look back, think about how much more focused you would be not just on every single moment and being present with yourself, with the people you love, with the goals that you have, the things that you're doing, but you would be so much more grateful and appreciative for every single moment that you have. And that's a really beautiful place to live. And I have experienced and I've always been a joyful person, but the joy I experienced just in the simple things, you know, just stepping outdoors and feeling the sun on my face and looking at a beautiful view, it's pure bliss to me. And we all have the ability to feel that bliss, but we're all so busy that we don't even allow ourselves to do that. Don't wait for a diagnosis or something like that to start living your life in that way. And another thing that I think has been so important is, you know, I now with everything that, that comes at me, it's like, if it's not going to get me closer to feeling like the human that I want to be at the end of my days, I won't do it. I just say no. Whereas before I'd say yes to everything and do, you know, whatever came at me. And now it's like, no, I need to take care of my health my relationships I want to be fully present for. I'm going to do the work that inspires me and, and brings out the best in all those around me. But the other stuff doesn't matter. And it really gets you clear on your boundaries. It gets you clear on what truly matters. And I encourage everyone to just I guess, start with thinking, you know, at the end of your days, what do you want to be remembered for? What work, What do you want people to be saying about you and your life? What do you, what do you want to know about you? You know, did I live? Did I matter? Because when you connect to that, it will lead you to focusing so much more on the things that you are choosing to do in your life and making sure that those things really matter. So I'd love to ask you, Siri, uh, in, in one final question, what does it mean to you to be human? Perfectly imperfect. Um, someone that has all the tools to be happy and to be my best self, but still, 
you know, is human and makes mistakes and gets in moments of self-pity or, you know, anxiety or worry or, you know, where I don't appreciate and love myself as much those moments happen. Being human is the most incredible experience that we all have the gift of having received. It's, I don't know, I find it so beautiful and so inspiring to try to understand myself and other humans, to recognize, you know, the patterns that get us in trouble, the patterns that lead us to great joy, it's, a, it's the human experience. We're all human. None of us are perfect. That's impossible. But in our being perfectly imperfect, there's such beauty in that. There's something, somebody just said to me the other day, I think it's in China or something, when a beautiful vase breaks, you know, they put it together and they use clay or something to, to put it back together again. And it's considered that much more beautiful after it's been fixed from being broken and it's worth so much more. I don't know if it's China, but it's somewhere. Saying that we become more and more beautiful. We don't become more and more broken because of the struggles or the pains that we go through. We become more and more beautiful because we evolve into who we really are. And there's a strength and a beauty and a pricelessness about that. And I believe that that's what being human is this beautiful experience of really becoming you. And I find that beautiful.